wonderful presentation by Irene. It's really nice to see the manufacturing, the real hands-on side of this industry. So, uh, because it is a big world of solar that's out there beyond the exciting research we do in our labs. I'm going to talk a little bit more back to some of the science. Um, my job today was to talk about three, five semiconductor solar cells. Uh, so I've, so I'm going to start through the basics and uh, work my way through. Some of there's been some good coverage already this morning, but uh, I'm going to review it quickly, in particular from a three-five uh, point of view. So semiconductor materials, uh, quick look at single junction solar cells, and then of course how those build into multi junction solar cells. Uh, I have a few slides on epitaxial growth, then the market applications of three fives, and some of the most advanced three five cells that are now being developed by several companies. So a lot of this coverage of materials is not stuff that I've done myself. I've uh, borrowed extensively uh, slides from the rest of our group here at SunLab, uh, as well as from various sources around, because it's, it's a broad uh, area of material. Semiconductor materials. Just really quickly going back to the periodic table, you know that uh, if you take a group one and a group seven atoms, so sodium and chloride, those bond together to make an ionic bond. It's a very strong bond and it's an insulator. But as we move closer to the, the middle of the periodic table into the group fours, those bonds are covalent bonds, so silicon and germanium. And as well, if you can mix the threes and fives, Together, those also form semiconductor compounds. Uh, and the greens are highlighted from twos and six elements to, that are twos and sixes from the periodic table that also can form uh, semiconductors. And how that looks in the crystal structure is uh, each silicon atom has four atoms, which combine with four atoms around it to create perfect octets. And you can do that with just silicon or with the three, five atoms, where the gallium is three valence electrons, and the arsenic has five valence electrons. Again, you get that perfect octet. Now, because these are covalent bonds, they can be broken without too much energy, and that will release an electron, a free electron, that can move around and cause conduction, and it leaves behind a hole, which is also a type of uh, alkali is part of the conductor. And from a band structure diagram, this is what it looks like. We take an electron out of a filled valence band, and it gets promoted to the empty conduction band where it can move around. Okay. A lot of this should be reviewed. Right? Uh, temperature, dopants, and photon absorption are all going to change the number of free carriers that we are moving around. Electrons in the conduction band and holes in the valence band. Uh, we can add dopants. To also uh, uh, add additional free carriers. Uh, in three fives, there's different ways of going about doing it. You can do, uh, I'm sorry, which one is uh, If we put a group four atom on a group three site, we'll, result, we'll have an extra valence electron. And this is what I'm showing here in N type conduction. The donors sit gap state, and we can, uh, with a small amount of energy, release that electron into the connection band, leaving behind a fixed charge donor atom. Similarly, you can put uh, four, uh, tin is another four type of stew to replace gallium, and the key opens typically for 3-5 materials would be carbon, a group four sitting on a, I'm sorry, that should be five, sitting on oxygen five, results in a missing valence electron. Or a group two, zinc or beryllium, replacing a group three would also be an acceptor. It's missing a valence electron, so it tends to act. It would have a donor band close to the valence band, and uh, it's able to accept an electron leaving behind a hole in the valence band. Uh, now the crystal structure that's here, the bonding strength and the atom size, all those things dictate both the lattice constant of that crystal as well as the bond strength, which ultimately is, uh, results in this band gap. So different alloys of threes and fives will have different parameters, both 
last constant and the band gap here. And this is a very handy chart of semiconductor alloys that shows you where they all sit on there. And mostly when we're working with uh, in solar cell, 3-5 solar cells, we're working with either germanium or gallium arsenide substrates, so we're going to work with the last constant of 5.6 something, 5 in this range. Uh, and you can see that you can hit a whole bunch of different alloys in there. Okay, I'll, we're going to come back to that chart a little bit later on. Single junction solar cells, well we know that the power out is related to current times voltage, and uh, really quickly here, the current is set by the number of photons that can be absorbed, and we know that you can absorb photons above that band gap. And the voltage, the maximum voltage, is set by the band gap of the material as well. So the band gap becomes very important in terms of how efficient a solar cell we can produce. And there's, uh, as was spoken to this morning, the thermalization effect where these hot, hot carriers uh, fall back down to the uh, alpha valent band, bottom of the spectrum band. So the voltage out from the solar cell, as we said, the maximum it can be is the uh, band gap. Actually, the band, it will actually be the band gap minus the um, Fermi level in the P and the Fermi level in the N. Um, and this PN junction is what creates the field which pulls our carriers apart. Now the current is related to the number of photons absorbed, as we've seen. And here we're looking at for silicon, this is an AM 1.5 spectrum, and we can only absorb photons above the band gap, but we lose a lot of the available energy in these higher energy photons because of the thermalization. So the net result for silicon is the available energy due to its band gap is 49.6% capable. So the loss mechanisms for a silicon cell, the spectrum loss is 49%. 20% of, of that is due to the below band gap and 30% due to uh, the thermalization effects. Next thing that happens is re two different other sorts of losses here. Recombination, where we're losing carriers uh, as they diffuse back to the uh, contacts. Uh, and pole mobilities play into that as well. Uh, pole mobilities are lower than electron mobilities in silicon, as we also saw this morning in Dr. Lopez's talk. Uh, finally, black body radiation plays into that too. So, so overall, the maximum theoretical efficiency for silicon is only 33% best we can get out of it. And because of those two factors that we can only use up carriers above the band gap, we get a current dependency, one over band gap, and voltage dependency was dependent on band gap, and this is part of how we get that, that curve the, uh, as we also saw this morning. And silicon sits in there at 1.1 EV, but it's cheap and it's abundant and it's pretty good to close to the peak, uh, and our commercial products are, well, the record 24% over 30 is pretty high, we're getting pretty close to the maximum we can get out of there. Gallium arsenide is a little bit better at 1.4 EV, it's pretty close to that maximum. Uh, the theory for that would be 33.7% efficient, and the current record is 28% efficiency is due to that. And this is a single junction gallium arsenide cell. Uh, additionally, gallium arsenide under 3.5 has the following advantages over silicon. It's a direct band gap and it's high carrier mobilities. Those would be included in the efficiencies. Uh, separate properties for efficiency would be radiation hardness and a lower temperature coefficient of the band gap. We'll see how those play a little bit as we go on. Direct versus indirect band gap. Again, we really saw this already this morning. Um, the way I think about it, just in a non-equations based approach to it, is because the carriers, to do, a, to do an absorption process, we need to interact with the lattice and have a lattice vibration. So it's a three particle process. And you can either, uh, so we're going to absorb a 
photon and either emit or absorb a phonon from that crystal to produce our electron hole pair. Uh, so that blurs what would be a sharp I'm sorry, what would be a sharp transition in a direct band gap becomes blurred because it's going to absorb or emit phonons in there. And the, as well the overall absorption efficiency is about an order of magnitude down. So already we're starting to see why there's some motivation, some uh, advantages to go to three fives, even just for a, sil a single junction cell. Now we want to look at multi-junction cells and how they can play out. Uh, we know that. Now if we are able to stack different alloys with different band gaps together, here's what we get. Um, absorption of different subcells in different portions of the spectrum. Overall, we're absorbing a much wider uh, wavelength range of that spectrum. And although there'll still be some thermalization, it won't be as significant because we have multiple band gaps in there to fall down to. Uh, we're stacking three cells together as multiple epitaxial layers that are connected in series. So the overall voltage coming out of this cell is a combination of those three. So we get a higher voltage. Out. That's great. That's going to improve our power out. But each subcell is connected in series. So we'll only allow one current to flow through that entire series stack. And what that means is that although these are absorbing a different portion of the spectrum, they may not ultimately produce the same amount of current. So you're going to be limited by whichever is the weakest of the three subcells. So there's some very wonderful design challenges in that. And, uh, cell manufacturers play with that. Uh, looking at that stack in a little bit more detail, uh, we have three junctions. Three subcells are also called separated with two tunnel junctions. Uh, these tunnel junctions have to be very highly doped. They're going, because uh, ultimately we have an NP, and then another cell that's an NP, and another cell that's an NP. We won't get good conduction through a, the PN junction here, except by employing the tunneling effect, where we have very, very highly doped layers that are very thin as well, and you can actually get tunneling across the thing. Uh, very small voltage drop want to try to design that to be as minimal as possible and be able to conduct the high currents that you need to flow through this cell. Okay. Uh, we'll segue on to how we're going to make this layer structure, which has got many, many different alloys all stacked together that have to be well controlled in terms of their doping and in terms of their layer thicknesses. And this is called epitaxy. So epitaxy is defined as the deposition of a crystalline overlayer on a crystalline substrate. Uh, and we call that overlayer an epitaxial film or an epitaxial layer. And it comes from the Greek root epi, which means above, and taxis, which means in an ordered manner. The substrate is going to act as our seed crystal. We have to follow the lattice constant, the lattice structure of that substrate. It locks it down. There's two different types of epitaxy, homo epitaxy, just putting the same alloy on, so that might be epitaxial germanium on a germanium substrate, or heteroepitaxy, which is mostly what we're doing here. A new alloy is being put down on underlying alloys of a different nature. Different flavor is what the term that I use in common chatting about stuff. Okay, so back to this uh, lovely diagram. Generally, we're going to be working with germanium substrates, although you do see some work also being done on gallium arsenide substrates. They're almost identical in lattice constants, so they're pretty close to interchangeable. Those three uh, subcells, one is made out of the germanium substrate. The second is gallium arsenide, or perhaps gallium arsenide with a smidge of indium. And if you can see here, this is in gas here. That's with 50% indium. I have to know that well because it's matched in the phosphide for optoelectronics. But following up that line, this is 
just plain gallium arsenate, if you move down that acidity, it would be like 1% indium is quite often seen in that middle subcell. And then the top subcell is indium, indium gallium phosphide or gallium indium phosphide. Those can be set interchangeably. Sitting up here. So we now have our three big band gaps and we cross. Um, germanium is preferred because it's getting down into those lower band gaps or higher energies. Sort of higher, longer wavelengths, so we can absorb a wider portion of the spectrum, and it also happens to be cheaper. These three five materials, the crystal structure is called zinc blend, and it's two interpenetrating FCC structures. Um, again, the, 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 there are tetrahedrals, one gallium ring surrounded by four arsenic. When we grow epitaxially, you can actually grow on different plane orientations depending on how your substrate is cut. But most typically for solar cells, it's cut on the O1 plane, so you're growing vertically as shown here, just new layers on top of that. Growth modes. Um, this is a pretty exaggerated view of what happens in epitaxial growth but it's true at the microscopic level. Ideally, you'd think we'd do perfectly planar layer by layer growth, but that can be actually hard to control because any imperfection in the crystal will cause preferential growth in a location, and then you can get bunching of growth in one area. Or if you have a high number of steps and terraces along, you can get step bunching where different steps grow faster than others and catch up and you get quite strong steps as well. So this is the preferred method to go. It's called step flow. And I have another graphic as well to show that nicely. But in general, which growth method, ha which growth method, sorry, growth mode happens depends a bit on your substrate surface morphology, your substrate temperature during growth, and your saturation of incoming animals. How much material are you throwing at this substrate? How quickly is that growth rate going? Um, so our substrates generally are polished to a smooth finish, and they also need to be clean and oxide-free, a term called epi-ready. And there's a certain cost associated with getting substrates epi-ready. And yeah, there's probably, like this, so a few impurities left at that initial interface, so there's typically a bit of a buffer layer thrown in, just that when you switch from the substrate to your starting epi. And typically, germanium substrates on the 1100, no sorry, usually it said 001, more or less the same thing, um, are miscut six degrees to give just enough of these steps for step flow growth. There's another couple pictures of that. And so the small miscut creates these terraces and the atoms can very nicely find a nook to add themselves into and continue to grow and propagate these step edges. Uh, in three fives on a group four substrate, there's actually, coming back to that same blend, there's actually, the germanium substrate is identical to this except all germanium. And it turns out there's actually two ways that you can put this zinc blend 3-5 combination onto an all germanium combination underneath it. I mean, growers figure out ways to minimize that because where you have that, and this is not maybe the best picture, but one way of showing it, this is looking at what are called dimers <coughs> on the surface at a step edge. So this is a step edge, which just shows a particular orientation. And these are dimers of arsenic. And, and they can orient themselves in two different ways. And if you have this happening on different portions of your substrate and then they combine, you'll get a crystal defect where those two different domains meet. And that's going to have crystal defects affect carrier like et cetera. Um, growers could explain a lot more detail about this. Uh, the main epitaxial growth are MOCBD, which is metal organic chemical vapor deposition, 
MBE, molecular gene epitaxy, and the third one is chemical gene epitaxy, or CBE. Um, CBE I'm not going to talk about here today. It sometimes also gets called molecular organic MBE. It's essentially it's a bit of a blend of these two and has some interesting properties to do with them. But I am going to talk to explain a little bit about both of these, as well as the stem cell or cell uh, manufacture. Okay, molecular beam epitaxy is done in a high vacuum chamber, right here. And you'll have these effusion cells, or nuts and cells, which contain elemental, solid element, usually solid elemental sources of the alloy, the elements you might want to put into an alloy. These solid sources are heated, and they deliver direct beams to your substrate. You need a high vacuum in order to have direct beams going straight to that substrate. Uh, you shuttle them to control the rate at which you're delivering the different atoms to that substrate. Um, and you control the temperature of your substrate with its chuck that's underneath. Because this is high vacuum, you can have an electron beam also uh, operating inside the chamber. And that allows for in-situ monitoring with a technique called reflection high energy electron diffraction. And you can use this to monitor how the growth is progressing. You can uh, also add in gas, gas based sources of MBE. Substrates held at about 400 degrees C. That's lower than MLTV, as we'll see. That's a good temperature for atoms to, when they hit the surface, to stick to it. Atoms <coughs> can move along the step a little bit to find a nice step out to the between themselves. And then those atoms, as they move around, their, as I basically already explained to you, the atoms naturally arrange themselves in the ordered crystal structure of the underlying substrate. Uh, the MBE chambers look something like this. Uh, it's high vacuum, high purity elemental sources means you can get quite high purity materials coming out of it. That makes it particularly great for aluminum containing materials because there's a low oxygen in the alignment. Aluminum loves oxygen and will make an aluminum oxide, which is not good. So MBE is well suited for aluminum alloys. Uh, the read monitoring, the high vacuum, the shutter control, the slow growth rate, all together allow for very good control, very good monitoring, and very good modeling of the growth. So it makes it a tool that's loved by research. Um, but it does have some inroads in production too. Okay, metal organic chemical vapor deposition now. Uh, reactor chambers look quite a bit different. This is in principle how it works. We have sources now which are um, liquids or gases. Uh, hydrogen or nitrogen are fed through to deliver gases to the chamber. The substrate is sitting right here and we have gas flow across that substrate and then uh, outputs go through a pump through a scrubber into the exhaust. So these um, sources come out as a precursor, uh, which I'll get to in the very next slide actually what they actually are. And you actually have a reaction happening on the surface or near the surface of the substrate <coughs> where the, these precursors are it's called cracking. We remove the metal organic. We remove the organic from the metal, leave the metal behind for the group three, and the organic comes off as a byproduct. Three fives are through an arsine or phosphine, so the hydrogen will escape off of this. Um, these are typically run at high flow rates, so we can get high growth rates. There's all these dynamic mixing effects. It's also a low vacuum technique, so you can't get a lot of electron beams in there, ways of watching what's actually going on. It's a bit more of a black art, uh, but high high flow put, high flow through as possible. Uh, the group C three sources are typically metal, metal organics, such as trimethyl gallium, TM2, 
TGA, it's also called triethylgallium is possible, uh, trimethylindium, trimethylaluminum, things like that. And the group fives are hydrides and arsine and phosphine. And you can also do uh, dopants, things like dimethyl zinc, diethyl uh, telluride, and this is a carbon bromide for carbon. Another look at what big reactors are like these days. There's different gas flow designs here. These are cool, these planetary reactors. They're each wafer or set of, in this case it's a set of three wafers, is spun, as well as the whole thing spinning around, and that's to get a uniform growth across the whole wafer. And then this, this one has a central shower head where the gas, this is like a half, a cross section, it's just showing half of that. You've shower head coming down the center across the substrate, you can across the whole chuck into the outside. So it's showing here receptor rotation and wafer rotation. Uh, no vacuum pumping, and that helps with the high throughput rates, but there are some toxic outputs to manage. Should I pause for just a quick second? Any questions on where we've gotten to so far with three fives and epitaxia growth? Yeah. Just a question about that graph a couple of slides back. The the last piece of graph. It was the doping of the different. Um, Which one are we going? To? That one. Yeah. You notice how in gallium arsenide you can move the gallium indium arsenide via two paths. There's, there's two lines from gallium arsenide to the gallium indium arsenide down there. Um, this. Can you find me? You can't. You can't. I'm not quite. One path comes to gallium SE. Yeah, it's so going it's like, over here. Yeah. It's gallium. That's why we use the. It's gallium SE. It just okay. happens to cross at that point. I don't know as, as much on the details. It, there aren't as many large ones, but you can s still have multiple wafers on that, I think. It gets to be a very big vacuum to manage at the same time, too, so it doesn't tend to grow as big. So if you're going to PPD, you can sort of look at the choice of LED manufacturer. Probably, yeah. It's majority is MLTPD. Not exclusively, but majority. Uh, one little comment I meant to make about MLCDD is that this is an epitaxial approach, but you will come across other CBD uh, deposition methodologies uh, that are non crystalline. Like you can deposit amorphous or uh, glasses and oxides and all sorts of other things with plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition, uh, various P other CBD. So the CBD itself doesn't mean epitaxy, but in this case, this MLCBD is an epitaxy. Uh, one little thing to note, this, this is, would be showing growth on a 111 plane because you have both arsenic and gallium on that same plane. I then later um, realized that that was the case, but it's still a nice picture. Uh, growing on the 111 plane, you'll get a plane of threes, then a plane of fives, then a plane of threes. Okay, really changing paths here. The market uses of three fives. Uh, just to bang out where they've come from and where they're going. We saw pictures earlier today about the Vanguard One satellite where the first solar cell went up. And that really was a big success, and quickly following that, solar cells were being added to satellites. In 1970, the first gas algas cell was developed. Um, and as we move forward, here's an in gap gas two junction cell developed in 1994, and triple junction cells in 1999. In terms of their implementation, well, uh, first concentrated system using silicon was in 1981, and it's only in um, 2000, 
2006 that there's been sort of a switch from silicon and concentrators to uh, 3.5s and concentrated CPU systems. But now it's it's really a dominant, it's a agreed upon approach that's being pursued by many companies. Well, first looking quickly at aerospace, it's actually still the biggest market by far for 3.5 multi-junction cells. Mostly for satellites, uh, we'll go on rovers too, not that there's as many of them. And companies like Encore, Spectralab, <coughs> Zero Space, they make their money on selling 3.5s to space. There's some new developments in flexible cells via et by etching the substrate. That'll make a contour fit and it's lighter. So those will have applications in unmanned aerial, for example, other aerospace applications. Microlink and Sharp are two companies going in that space. The differences between cells for space and cells for terrestrial, well, the spectrum is different. You can see the red is the AM 1.0 spectrum, got a lot more in the UV here, and you're not missing some of those ones. As well, radiation. The high energy particles of radiation that cause crystal damage, which end up acting like deep recombination centers in your crystal, and those lower the minority carrier like us. Uh, so cells that can that have a high radiation hardness and have a long lifetime in space are being sought for the space market. You'll have micrometeorite type particles for physical damage and very extreme thermal environments. Minus 80 to 55 after circulating around space. The driving factor in this market is the power to weight ratio. Not the cost. So it takes a lot of energy a lot of fuel basically to get every kilogram of weight up into space and you want high efficiency on your uh, up there once once you've deployed and sent it up. So the three flies fit that quite nicely. Okay, now moving on to market uses on a terrestrial, which is essentially CPD. Now concentrating photonics. <coughs> So the cost of these 3.5 cells is high. It's due to the epitaxy and the high materials input costs. They're expensive, so the solution to bring this into terrestrial application is to couple it with inexpensive concentrating optics and work with a very small cell. Typically, the industry has settled in on about 500 times concentration. These lenses are made out of either silicon on glass or all acrylic, PMMA. And so the majority of your material is this and any MAC racking. There'll be a uh, cell down here on some sort of a heat sink, typically a passive heat sink. There's no active cooling in most systems out there. Not exclusively, but in most. So the our modules are going to be an array of optics plus cells. As we know that the solar spectrum varies with where you are on Earth and with the time of day. And the impact of this, for multi-junction solar cells in particular, is that your current balancing, remember we talked about those three cells in series, the current balancing between those three cells is important for the overall performance. But over the course of the day, it's gonna experience a different spectrum. So there's gonna be perhaps a different weakest link in the early and late parts of the day compared to the middle of the day. That's another design challenge in the field. Uh, the nice thing about under concentration is that if your maximum power point goes up and you actually get an efficiency increase. It increase efficiency increases with the log of concentration. And that's essentially, you can see it from a fill factor point of view, that rectangles get, this is getting closer to a square. Uh, efficiency does decrease a bit with temperature because of the VOC shifts, but overall, the, the end, the efficiency drop per degree Celsius is relatively small. It's 1.5. 
one-tenth the value chosen. So that makes it a good in hot temperature location. Uh, looking at it another way, efficiency increase versus concentration, you can see it comes up here. There's a roll off at very high concentrations due to um, series resistance. And silicon too will get an efficiency increase with uh, concentration, but it's not as dramatic and it rolls off sooner. So you can actually see low concentration PV crystals that use silicon cells. They tend to sit around a 10 to 100 ton concentration, whereas the PFIs tend to sit around a five, 500 ton concentration. Here's what a cell on carrier looks like. Um, cells are either one centimeter by one centimeter squared, or nearly half of that, or a quarter of that, 5.5 by 5.5 millimeters on each side is the standard. This is really important, getting that cell properly bonded to the carrier, because there's a lot of current running through these cells, and so a lot of heating as well on this very small thing. You need optimized thermal properties of that carrier, and the solder, which can either be um, the attach can either be solder or epoxy. That needs to be done with high accuracy in the case, or you'll get localized term, uh, heating effects and thermal runaway. And bond wires, lots of bond wires capable of managing the high currents in the two amps range. <coughs> There's lots of different concentrator designs out there. This is one interesting thing about this field is it's um, there's deployments out there, but it's still relatively immature. There's lots of different innovations going on. I'll show you some of three of the main ones. One is a Fresnel lens, focusing down to a point, a parabolic mirror, and a Cassegrain optics reflective, double bounce reflector. No matter what way you're going to concentrate that, you'll have a very small acceptance angle. So essentially, you need to point directly at the sun. And so we're only going to harvest the direct normal instance portion of the sunlight. Diffuse sunlight on a cloudy day like today uh, doesn't get seen by the optic, doesn't get focused on the cell. It's lost portion of the solar resource. It's only the direct normal instance of any good clear sky days. And to do that, you also need to mount these on a high precision dual axis tracker building to a more complex system than a flat uh, panel that you can just slap on a roof. That is true. Some of the big companies, some examples of what's out there, uh, these are the big three, Soytech. They use the double bounce mirror. No, I'm sorry, they don't. It's a Fresnel lens at 500 times concentration. And the next as well is a Fresnel lens system. These guys have designed big call these things mega modules and they get mounted by huge cranes onto huge trackers. And it's impressive if you can go online and see them moving around. These are a bit smaller. The sole focus is a double bounce reflective design. Primary mirror uh, focuses light to a secondary mirror and focuses down onto the cell. All these companies have megawatt size installations uh, and pilot plants going into the ground at the moment. Uh, Morgan Solar is a company in Toronto that uh, the Sun Lab here works with, and they have an innovative design that uses total internal reflection. The light, there's a uh, multiple layer structure here that's able to deflect the light into a lower light guide layer, which carries the light towards the center, goes off a center optic, and onto the cell that's there. You're seeing here the Gen 3 design, which is a hexagonal structure, and those fit together like a honeycomb. These end up being very compact, very lightweight, which makes shipping them low, and it also really aimed at being low in terms of manufacturing cost. Uh, most recently, they've come up with an innovative tracker design, too, that's designed to be uh, you can go out in a light truck and be installed by a couple guys and screwdrivers. That's the approach that one solar is taking on this is inexpensive, uh, easy to install those sorts of advantages, which is quite interesting. We're enjoying working with them. You can, actually I'll come to it later. A few other designs that are out there. Uh, just as I mentioned, this is a low concentration system, Skyline Solar, using silicon cells. Uh, these are giant mirror dishes that focus to an array. Both of these guys, you can see here, it's 
so much sun power being focused to a spot that this actually glows. Uh, and uh, here at the Sun Lab, we have two different CPD test sites. This one is right on campus. You just step outside here and look across the street to the parquet structure. You can see our structures up there, and I believe there'll be tours on Friday. Uh, and this other one is located at the National Research Council out in East End Town on Montreal Road. So this one is, was in partnership with Morgan Solar, with the uh, Ontario government-funded uh, project. And this one we called the Sunrise Project was with uh, Opal. Uh, and Opal was another Fresnel lens optic design. It's mounted on a pole mount uh, tracker. This is a carousel-style tracker. Uh, and our job, our role is to develop some, some accurate and customized for out here, um, as well as collecting solar resource data through a spectral radiometer, product radiometer, at both locations. We're really evolving the analysis capability, monitoring capabilities with our partners and with our, uh, and the research aspect of that too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Morgan Solar cell seems uh, pretty light. How efficient is the total internal reflection compared to other concentrations? number on that. Um, there's going to be a, there's, it's made out of the same PMMA as some of the Fresnel lenses. They're both made out of the same sort of plastics, designed to last a long time outside. This has a slightly longer light path, uh, path length for the plastic, so that's going to affect somewhat the uh, transfer function. Uh, but overall, it's coming out really good. So. one particular analysis, and they do vary by who does it and over time. You can see that the cells, the 3-5 cells, only account for 8% in this particular analysis of the total cost of the whole system. Although this does include 20% for profit markup, because this is full, uh, is, uh, and install is in here as well. So out of the entire system in the ground, you can see cells, uh, receiver assembly, primary optics, module assembly 11%, inverter 13%, tractor at 22% might be a little bit high, let's see other numbers. Overall, um, the cost of all of this much more complex system than a flat plate is still uh, approaching, it's still competitive. Um, right now, speaking with people at CPD8 last month, installed cost of about $3 per water being achieved, which is competitive with flat plate in the same sort of ballpark range, two to four. Uh, the challenges of CPD is combining the requirements of high performance with low cost. The cells have to be efficient, but not too expensive. The current extraction through that cell and carrier must be effective and reliable. And the optics have to be low cost yet still provide very highly accurate focusing with good spatial uniformity, high optical efficiency, etc. And then the tracking structure too has to be expensive yet accurate and reliable. And I underline that because right now that's a little bit of an important field in these systems, most of the maintenance things moving forward as we've experienced and even out there in the field, it's just cracker downtime for one thing or another. But I think that's partly because it's a young market and uh, integrating crackers with a module that's also new and just making everything all work uh, together takes a little bit of time. So I actually see that as an opportunity as well because CPD is younger. There's a big learning curve to experience and to bring, bring up reliability, bring down cost, all of those sorts of things. Uh, deployments is a growing uh, industry out there. Uh, 515 uh, megawatts to be installed this year. Small numbers, but the growth is significant. <coughs> Where are the hot markets for CPD? Well, it's going to be in the Sun Belt primarily. And as I said, it's direct normal incidents that we're 
really looking for here. And there's some areas of the world which are extremely high for direct and long distance. Uh, Southwest US, northern Mexico, Chile, um, down other parts of South America, South Africa, North Africa, Arabia, Saudi Arabia, and India, and Australia. Australia's got quite a strong EPD industry, for example. And the other, you know, we're part of uh, Spain and Italy as well. advantages is solar is actually already today hitting grid parity in high sun regions, grid competitive. And those regions tend to already have high DNI and low diffuse you know, levels. They also have hot temperatures. So if you recall, I showed that the three fives have a very much lower um, change in efficiency over temperature. So that's an advantage. You can have whatever the the power rating of your panels are when you put them in the ground stays much closer to that when you put them in the ground in Saudi Arabia versus uh, you know, uh, a significant percentages drop, like 10 to 40 percent drop in efficiency with silicon flat plate in hot temperature environments. Um, and also those regions tend to have low water availability. And this plays out against another kind of concentrating approach, which is called CSP concentrated solar power, and that's where we're focusing the sun uh, onto, it's e there's either troughs or power tower versions, where you're focusing the sun to superheat uh, a liquid, which you then use to uh, create steam to drive a turbine. So those are, uh, they compete a bit against each other in these high DNI regions, but the low water availability is one thing that you see here. CPD is very low in, in uh, water demand. Whereas the high DNI and hot temperatures tend to make tip the scales for CPD over PD. Additionally, CPD is much more easily scalable than CSP. And finally, the materials of them are readily available, so around 70% recyclable. Uh, the market segmentation then is I think a CPD generally going to be played out as a farm on the ground. We're not going to put, at least today, the way most common systems and the pictures I showed you, they aren't going to go on a rooftop. So I think that will evolve too. Uh, but current industry is looking more at larger deployments. And at high, this is basically DNI, so high DNI regions. PD can play out in lower DNI regions and right down to the micro size projects. CSP is only plays out in very large uh, deployments, as well in the high DNI regions. Uh, this is a chart of the LCOE, which is levelized cost of energy, so the cents per kilowatt hour of electricity that your power plant can deliver, as a function of the DNI, and that's DNI per day, whereas this is per year. So it's just a factor of 365 between those two numbers, and you can see. The projections are, this is a projection coming from the CPD consortium, so an industry association. They're projecting that above a DNI of six, uh, CPD can win out over other solar technology. Lower regions, it probably won't. And so where we are in uh, Canada and Ontario, we're in the four range. So that's, we're most likely gonna stick with those standard flat plate technologies for today, but that's today's numbers. Uh, the cost, um, being a young technology that can mature through increased efficiency and reduced cost, this whole curve may shift down with time at a faster rate than some of these other curves. So this crossover point will likely shift back to different low DNI regions over time. Uh, the last few minutes on back to the cells now. How are the cells doing in terms of increasing their efficiencies? So there's different ways you can go about improving the current and voltage output of these cells to further increase your power. One is to rebalance the currents out of three cells. And this is done by, one approach is to add quantum dots. This is done by Sirian, an Ottawa company, who we've done some collaborations with that steals some current from the bottom subcell into the middle subcell. And the 
wanted to see that bottom stem cell because it's got this little bit of white spectrum in here. It um, has an oversupply of current and the free junction cell is most likely limited by the top or middle. Top or middle. So this grabs a bit of current for an efficiency increase in the 5 to 10 percent range. And uh, a company called Quantus Bowl was working similarly on that with Quantum Wells. And they were purchased by JDS cells have um, shorter minor minority carrier diffusion lengths, which is a thinner essentially, and that improves the radiation balance. So there's some motivations for space outside of the efficiency per se. Uh, and that by the time you get six cells, uh, theoretical efficiency is six, sorry, 78%. Although if you start balancing this because the spectrums are different, design might be different for space versus terrestrial. But there's good companies and research labs working on these. Uh, another neat one is thin small cells. A company called Semprius is using this microprinting technology. I don't know much about it beyond this picture really. Uh, but they have very, very small cells that they're able to lift off and then put down on a substrate. They have micro size optics for micro concentrators, one per cell, essentially. And by being so small and thin, they have lower heating. And so they can operate at a higher concentration before that roll off happens. And they currently hold the, the record for, this is a module efficiency of 33%. Taking a step back, actually, the cells are currently being manufactured, uh, starting to hit 40% efficiency. Uh, record was 43%. Uh, when you couple that into a system, there's going to be some losses from the optics and the whole combination of everything as a whole. Um, module efficiencies are in the 30% range today. And those will improve as well as the cells improving. Um, I think we'll probably see some 34, 35% module efficiency numbers coming out in the next year or so. That's sort of where we're at. Rate of change over time. This is really marching up. 
why will it continue in the future? Well, if it does, you might see a 50% efficient cell by 2020. Which really can lay out a lot in terms of how inexpensive your system as a whole is. So, I think I should probably wrap up. We're getting meet, meeting a coffee, I'm sure. So the, the three five materials do have some winning combination of properties that allow very high efficiency solar cells. The direct band gap, increase the high absorption, the high mobilities, the low temperature shift, temperature dependent shift in efficiency. Uh, gallium arsenide as a single junction cell is pretty close to ideal for one junction. And really most importantly, the epitaxy allows us to grow multiple alloy layers to create multiple subcells and really engineer the perfect subcell through all of these layers. And I mentioned that, 43, maybe perhaps towards 50. Uh, three junction cells are in common use today right now for space solar arrays and also in the, the Yen CPD market. Uh, the epitaxy uh, both is more expensive, smaller, more expensive substrates and more, therefore more expensive cells, but we combine them with CPD to bring down an overall uh, attractive cost that can provide grid parity uh, in, right now, today, in high VNI areas. And the growth in those high sun regions, it, there hasn't been much solar deployed in those high sun regions because in general there are less developed uh, area of the world, but as deployments uh, saturate perhaps in parts of Germany and companies are growing and getting in the market space, they're looking for new market opportunities and countries all over the world in particular in those sun belts are now turning themselves to looking at solar. Saudi Arabia, in fact, just announced a, a massive heat and tariff program there. They're going to deploy as much solar in a few years as all the U.S. has already installed. So there's, there's some high growth that's going to happen in some new areas of the world. And the, the CPD attributes suit those, those areas very well. It's a complicated system, so you need some accurate measurement and modeling in order to have that system reach its full potential. For example, complex interdependent systems like the angle, angular acceptance, the wavelength, the current matching of subcells, all of these things. So just to finish off, what the Sun Lab does is we work a lot. We have what we believe is collaborative excellence to working with our partners in the evaluation of these three, five cells and the CPD system through indoor testing, outdoor testing, mod extensive computer physics modeling of all aspects of the, of the materials, of the optics, of the system, of the solar resource. And here's a picture of most of us and names. Many, almost everyone here is among us. So we hope you get a chance to enjoy your visit here to Ottawa today and, and see if some of our labs on Friday or throughout the week. And thanks to others who helped provide me with material for this. Started. I'm also really keen on the solar industry, not just as a technical thing, but beyond that, in terms of what's happening in policy with the Canadian Tariff Program, for example, in Ontario. And uh, I have a five kilowatt system on my house installed in September. And uh, I also get involved with community ownership of solar projects with a cooperative. And outside the topic of today, but if anyone wants to ask me any questions about that because we're all learning about solar and how it plays out and the policy and the technical and the logistical issues all come into play in terms of actually rolling out this really phenomenal technology into deployment. So I'd love to converse with anyone that feels like asking about that. Thanks very much. I think so. So far, it looks pretty good. I need to reanalyze uh, my 
shading to take into account more shading in the winter months versus the summer months. I don't, I need to close those numbers, but I think it's going to work out. I really, you need to go at least a whole year to be sure, right? And I'm not there yet. study and we're planning to do some more to actually fully evaluate cell cost versus impact on the whole system. I mean if you look at that pie graph that was full system installed including install cost and profit and I had to sell at 8%. Um, so it's not a huge impact. What's really interesting in that though is any efficiency improvement you can bring to the cell, let's say you bring a 1% one, uh, 1 improvement efficiency with no cost change to the cell, that's a big difference in terms of your, you haven't changed any of your costs, um, it, well that would normally impact the system I suppose by 1% too, but I went off track. There's, you can have, you can build a very expensive high efficiency cell and still overall deliver a more cost effective system because it's only a portion of all of those other costs. So you can look at cost of cell versus cost of system uh, graphs. I, sorry, I don't have those included in my stuff today. Um, so for some of the optics, especially like the Morgan and John uh, optics, it's got quite a long path length through the, the polymer there. So do yeah. you, so presumably there's a different spectrum actually coming out of the optics or is there any optimization of your layer thicknesses for the particular spectrum of the that's coming out of the optics? Yeah, you, you can look at that. You can look at whether that's worth it or not versus dealing with a, just a commercially purchased cell or um, getting a customized cell. And that's something that obviously any good company would have. Everyone's needing some sweets and some coffees. <laughs> Any further questions? If not, please join me to thank the whole